Hi, and welcome to Genre and the Rhetorical Situation, an introductory lecture that will take us through a variety of important definitions and concepts, all of which are central for understanding texts. My name is Dr. Corinne Hinton, and I am an assistant professor of English at Texas A&M University, Texarkana, and I will be your guide today. At the end of this presentation, you should better understand the ways in which texts are composed of different elements and how those elements can be analyzed, or broken down, into their individual parts or features. Additionally, you'll learn that when these features are synthesized or brought together in particular combinations, their products become the genres or types of writing we recognize today. Before we can examine how texts are broken down, we have to begin with a basic definition of the word you'll hear used quite often by English professors, and that word is genre. When used, genre can have different meanings depending on how the word is being used and the person using it. Consider the following. If someone asked you what kind of movies or books you like, you might say something like sci-fi, or romance, or true crime, or horror. All of these are genres of films or books. Most of us can immediately think of the ways in which a science fiction novel might differ from a romance novel. In the first, the characters and setting can be based in reality or wholly invented, strange worlds and creatures never before seen. In sci-fi, we readers or moviegoers live and enjoy the fantasy the authors or filmmakers create for us. Romance, on the other hand, attempts to engage our own emotions as humans, and because of that, the audience expects a much larger degree of realism. I need to believe, for example, the man of my dreams is out there, and this novel or movie is going to tell me a love story that I believe could really happen. Thus, the characters and the setting in many ways have to be grounded in the believable. But this definition of genre is not the only way the term is used. If someone asked you what kind of things you like to read, you might say something like poetry, drama, novels, short stories, or graphic novels. These, like your answers from the previous question, are also considered genres. Only instead of applying the term to multiple forms of media, films or books or music, we're applying it specifically to the study of written or textual forms of media. In this case, most people can also identify some differences among these genres as well. For example, we might say that a short story is like a novel and that they both tell stories, but that short stories are, well, quite obviously shorter. On the other hand, a poem might tell a story, or it might not. A, po a poem might rhyme, or it might not. All of these characteristics you know or think you know about a particular genre we will call features. Like people, texts also have features that make them particularly unique. For example, if we consider the human face, we might break the face down into several features. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, cheeks, hairline, hair, chin. We can study a person's face by examining each feature individually. Each feature, when analyzed on its own, might have an interesting story to tell. Consider a pair of eyes. We might look at the shape, the size, the color, the placement in relationship to other features. What conclusion might we draw about a person who belongs to these eyes? Well, I might have a conclusion that differs from yours. I might say, for instance, that this person is scared because the eyebrows are slightly raised, the blue eyes are widened. But the eyes, as just one feature of the face, tell only part of the whole story. When we recombine these features, or synthesize them, back into what we recognize as a human face, we may now have reached a different conclusion, one that's new from the one we offered about just the person's eyes. This, by the way, is Ted Bundy, the famous serial killer, so maybe my conclusion about his eyes wasn't initially correct. After my synthesis, I might form a new conclusion about both his eyes as one feature and his face as the genre or the synthesis of these features together. For our purposes in this advanced writing class, we'll use the term genre in two ways. 
First, we use genre to describe the three major categories of writing outlined in your textbook. Narrative writing, or writing that tells a story. Persuasive writing, or writing designed to get its reader to do, think, or believe something. And informative writing, writing designed to share information. Second, we will also use the term genre or subgenre to identify the types of writing that occur within each of these major categories. For example, within narrative writing, we might refer to the literacy narrative genre, or the obituary, or the photo essay. Likewise, types of persuasive subgenres include advertisements, editorials, or collages. And finally, within the informative genre, we might describe the encyclopedia entry, the news article, or the peer-reviewed journal article as a genre or subgenre. All of these genres, like the human face, have individual features that can be analyzed and synthesized. During our, anal our analysis and synthesis processes, we can make conclusions about how a successful text is based on the success of its features. But before we can decide how successful a particular news article is, for example, we need to learn to identify the features of that text, just like we identify the features of a face. For our purposes in this advanced writing class, we'll use the term genre in two ways. First, we use genre to describe the three major categories of writing outlined in your textbook. Narrative writing, or writing that tells a story. Persuasive writing, or writing designed to get its reader to do, think, or believe something. And informative writing, writing designed to share information. Second, we will also use the term genre or subgenre to identify the types of writing that occur within each of these major categories. For example, within narrative writing, we might In the first chapter of your book, the authors introduce you to the concept of the rhetorical situation. The rhetorical situation is a phrase we use to describe the combination of textual features. Think of the rhetorical situation as the text's face. It is the combination of features that make up a particular text. As a result of combining certain features in certain ways, we end up with a piece of text that is recognizable to us as a particular genre. This slide shows an image illustrating how all of the features of a text are combined into the rhetorical situation. This image displays the rhetorical situation as consisting of three major parts. First, the contextual features of a text, purpose, constraints, and occasion. Contextual features are the three elements that determine a text's context or the environment for writing. What is the author's purpose for writing this particular text? What constraints allow for this writing? What is the occasion or circumstances surrounding the author's desire to write? Second, generative features, the author, the audience, and the subject about which you are writing. In this case, generative features are those that are the primary features responsible for generating the writing. That is, all writing must have an author, either an individual or even a corporation or organization, an audience for whom that writing is intended, and a subject about which the author is writing. And finally, the stylistic features of a text, its form, style, use of rhetorical appeals, the medium of its delivery, and the conventions that guide the genre. In this case, the stylistic features refer to what is happening with the actual content, the writing itself. What kind of structure or form does it take? What writing style is the author using? What rhetorical appeals is the author employing and for what reason? How is the writing being delivered to its audience, in print, on the web, orally during a presentation? Finally, what conventions of a particular genre are the author following or not? That is, to what degree is the author abiding by the guidelines that govern that genre? The rhetorical situation is very complex because there are so many individual parts we can examine in order to draw a conclusion about how successful a text or its author are. Let's look a bit at some of the two more complicated elements of the rhetorical situation in detail, rhetorical appeals and genre conventions. First, let's review rhetorical appeals. Your book covers these in brief during the opening chapter, but I want to spend a bit more time on them in case these are new for you. Rhetorical appeals are one feature of a text and are, perhaps, one of the oldest known identifiable features. The Greek philosopher Aristotle is often referred to as the father of rhetoric. 
Rhetoric, in its original definition, referred to the ability to persuade others. Back in 300 BC, written language as we know it was still emerging. Most people received information and entertainment through verbal communication. When a new law came out, you learned of it verbally. When a grand ceremony was going to be held in the town square, you learned of it verbally. In Aristotle's eyes, a speaker, also referred to as an orator, could convince his or her audience through the combination of three kinds of appeals. Even today, we still refer to these three appeals or strategies by their Greek identifiers, ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos, derived from the Greek, means character. In this case, we use ethos to describe the strategies by which an author establishes his or her credibility. Audiences are more likely to be persuaded by an author they believe is credible, reliable, and authoritative. How does an author prove that he or she is credible, reliable, and authoritative? Well, an author might write only on issues on which he or she is an expert. For example, if I'm a trained zoologist, I probably wouldn't establish a credible ethos if I published a piece on meteorology. Or if I'm a child care specialist, I probably wouldn't establish a credible ethos by writing about chemical reactions. Thus, our backgrounds, personal, professional, and academic, can be central to helping establish our ethos. Additionally, an author might ensure that he or she presents himself or herself as credible and reliable by presenting evidence in a way that isn't skewed or unethical and by removing words that might suggest he or she is personally biased. Logos, from the Greek word logic, refers to the strategies an author uses to present a logical case on the point he or she is making. Audiences are likely to believe an author who presents his or her case using strong logical appeals. Strategies by which an author accomplishes this include logical fallacies, selecting and incorporating current and relevant evidence from reliable sources, conducting research in an ethical and rigorous manner, and developing one's ideas using reasoning and a structure or form that the reader can easily follow. Lastly, pathos. From the Greek word meaning suffering, pathos refers to the strategies by which an author appeals to his or her audience's emotions. While logos might get to our heads, pathos gets to our hearts. Humans can be tricky creatures, and we don't always make decisions on what is best for us logically. Rather, we sometimes make decisions based on how we feel about something or someone. For example, I might be more willing to donate to a children's charity if I see an advertisement showing children who don't have enough to eat or who don't have the proper clothing during winter. Pathos also refers to appeals to an audience's values. We develop our values through a combination of personal, social, and cultural influences. We may feel a certain way about something because we were raised that way, or our friends or coworkers feel that way, or because our church or school says we should feel that way. In this way, an author might attempt to appeal to our sense of patriotism or loyalty, for example, or based on what we think is morally right or good. We might recognize that a particular advertisement is attempting to persuade us to donate money to a charity, but how does the author do that? Employing pathos means using strategies such as words or images that evoke particular emotional responses, using storytelling or imagery to connect, connect the reader to the subject, or using rhetorical moves that help build connections. Rhetorical moves might be another term with which you are unfamiliar. Rhetorical moves help make the language of our writing more pleasing and therefore more effective for readers. If we like what we hear, then we are more likely to believe what the reader says. This is why, for example, political rhetoric is so convincing, even if it's crap. For example, repetition is a common rhetorical move. 
If we repeat or word a phrase from a reader, he or she is more likely to remember that phrase and be connected to it. In Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s historic I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King often repeats phrases such as now is the time in order to provoke an emotional response from his audience. Other pathos-inspired rhetorical moves include alliteration and parallelism. Alliteration refers to repeating the same sounds in a word to draw attention to them, like a news headline that says, school teacher spits during spirited spat. Parallelism refers to setting up a sentence so that multiple items appear in the same grammatical form. For example, a sentence that is not parallel might say, we should stop smoking cigarettes and leave alcohol alone. Whereas the same sentence in parallel form would read, we should stop smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol. We've just covered the three rhetorical appeals. Another set of features with which you should familiarize yourselves are genre conventions. Your book discusses this, but I'll take some time to explain it a bit more. We've already talked about how we define genre as categories of writing. So genre conventions refer to the characteristics of a text a reader has learned to expect for that particular genre. You might ask, what do you mean by the features a reader expects? Like rules? Well, sort of. What if I asked you, what characterizes a fairy tale? You might say things like a castle, a princess, a dragon. But you might also say things like once upon a time or happily ever after. These are characteristics we have learned to expect from a piece of writing that calls itself a fairy tale. When authors break from these conventions, like a fairy tale with a setting in space, readers question whether or not that piece of writing really qualifies as the genre it calls itself. Therefore, we might also think of genre conventions as rules that govern whether or not a piece of writing fits within its genre. However, rules might be too strong. Rather, think of genre conventions as guidelines. Sometimes an author can follow all of the conventions, and sometimes he or she can break one of these and the writing still fits into that category. Genre conventions guide what a text should do, but might not always do, and what an author should do, but might not always do. For example, genre conventions can help influence features of the text, such as its length, the way it is delivered, or the content's organization or structure. Genre conventions might also shape the way an author is expected to write, such as the level of objectivity or subjectivity an author is permitted, whether or not he or she is expected to include research, and his or her tone. Thus, part of what this course and your textbook will do is to walk you through several genres and share with you that genre's conventions. Therefore, you learn to recognize what makes a news article a news article, and what makes a news article different from a peer-reviewed journal article or from a photo essay. Now that you have a solid foundation about genre, the rhetorical situation, rhetorical appeals, and genre conventions, you have the context you need to go forward with evaluating texts successfully.